Welcome, I'm Evan Weiner, And I'm Bill Daughtry. Welcome to Between the Lines. Our guest is the executive director of the National Basketball Players Association, Mr. Lawrence Fleischer. Mr. Fleischer is a longtime fixture in NBA management union talks as a player agent, as a lawyer, and of course, as a union head. Players and management have in the past been able to work out their differences. Going back to the last bargaining agreement, the union agreed to radical changes in sport, a salary cap to help the owners who were struggling. They also agreed to a drug clause in their contract. If somebody flunked the drug test, they had a shot at rehabilitation without penalty. And it was the right of first refusal for free agents. Today, the owners and players aren't getting along as well as they have. Now, there have been signs that there are differences between union and management, and those differences are widening. Larry Fleischer is head of the NBA Players Association. What's so wrong with the system that existed in the last bargaining agreement, which has just expired, and better yet, why should it be changed? I think the most important uh, aspect is to recognize in 1983, when we entered into this collective bargaining agreement, the NBA was in serious financial trouble. There were a number of teams that were suffering and needed help. We compromised. We agreed to a salary cap in exchange for a guaranteed 53% of the revenues, as well as a system of free agency where players would be able to leave when their contracts expired. Two things have happened. We didn't get the movement. The clubs have obviously gotten together and colluded and kept players who were free agents from leaving. The right of first refusal has not worked, and that has offended many, many of our players. And secondly, there isn't any need any longer for an artificial cap on salaries. The league is in the strongest financial position it's ever been in. <clears throat> the players are now saying, as long as the industry is strong, then why not operate like any other industry? Let people be free in their bargaining positions. Let them come to work for whatever club they want to come to work for. Let them be bound by a contract for however long that contract uh, is stated and then let them go wherever else they want to go. Both sides then can operate completely as any other company supposedly can in the United States, and when that happens, we can have a satisfactory collective bargaining agreement. Larry, you know that the owners don't want the system changed. In fact, one of the owners has said they're not going to have any kind of an agreement unless there's a draft included in the collective bargaining negotiations. So what happens? How can you have an agreement if they say you have to have a draft and you say we don't want a draft? Well, it makes it very difficult. If you start with a preconceived notion that you're not going to change anything, that everything that you have is sacrosanct and must remain because it's already in place, it makes it very difficult. And that's why our negotiations up until today have not been overwhelmingly successful, to say the least. Uh, we've walked out of the last uh, set of meetings far apart, probably further apart than we were when we first started. Uh, the draft is a, an interesting example. It is something that has evolved way back when, when there were no uh, opportunities for players to be organized or to have any say as to their um, future. As a result, it has been accepted by the media and by the fans as something that must exist. It doesn't have to exist. It doesn't serve any useful function. The Boston Celtics win every year. The Los Angeles Lakers win every year. It doesn't matter whether there's a draft or it's not a draft. It's just a means of holding down initial salaries. Hopefully, the other side will understand that. If not, we're in for a long summer. Larry Fleischer is our guest, and we'll be back with more Between the Lines following this message. Welcome to Back Between the Lines. Lawrence Fleischer, head of the National Basketball Players Association, is our guest. Larry, we talked about the salary cap a little bit earlier on. I've got to ask you, do you feel that at the time, with the economic state of the game in the NBA, do you feel that the salary cap possibly saved the existence of the league as we know it today? I'm not sure you have to get that far. I'm not sure we saved the NBA. I think we definitely put some stability in the NBA, uh, financial stability, and helped it during that period of time. I think one of the uh, advantages of our union is has been our flexibility. You had mentioned earlier on the drug agreement. That drug agreement really came forward as a result of the players saying, 
we want to do certain things to help. The same thing with the salary cap. But don't punish us by that. What we're saying is we've helped you when you needed help. Don't now twist the knife in our back and say we've got it, we want to keep it there forever. There was a place and a time for it. We did what we had to do. Now we're saying there is no need for it. Not when teams are coming into the league at $32.5 million as a entrance fee, when the entrance fee used to be 11 and $12 million. The sport couldn't be healthier, and there's no reason for artificial restraints. Larry, another problem, and this may affect fans more directly than all the other issues, injuries. Bill Cartwright has missed a season. Bill Walton has missed, what, three, four years. Kevin McHale may miss the season coming up. They've all been injured. They've all had stress fractures of the foot or both feet. Are injuries a problem? Travel schedule lead into the injuries? Do the players get enough rest? And do you have any solutions to the injury problems? Well, I think that the, um, the problem with Bill Cartwright is one which is um, existing throughout the league in, in greater numbers. We are definitely having uh, difficulties with understanding what is wrong with the athlete, the professional basketball player's foot. We have Frank Johnson, we have Darryl Griffith, and a group of others. Bill Walton, obviously, is the most uh, famous one. And we haven't resolved the problem yet. Uh, there is some congenital problems that are now beginning to show up. Um, we do have theories that the uh, athletic shoe isn't quite as strong and doesn't have as much support as it had years before. Probably uh, the worst and the easiest way to describe it is the players are bigger, they're faster, they're jumping more. And I think that the bone structure in the foot isn't prepared to handle that kind of stress on a constant basis. As for other injuries, I don't think there are any more than there ever were in the past. I think it's just about the same. But we, are, we have seen in the last three or four years a tremendous increase in the number of stress fractures or, or bone fractures in the foot. All right, with regard to the physical situation, things don't figure to get much easier. You've got two teams coming into the league next year with expansion. That means an increased travel schedule. And uh, two more enter in 1989. The travel situation uh, isn't going to get any easier, nor is the, the length of the season. Uh, does that aspect of expansion bother you, the additional travel? Do you think that could lead to more injuries? I think anything that results in the players being more tired is going to result in injuries. We really probably haven't done enough of our own homework to get answers on that, although I must tell you we have talked to any number of orthopedic surgeons and tried to get a consensus of what is the cause of all these injuries. Tiredness has to be a factor. Uh, I personally have a feeling that a, uh, the trend started 15 years ago when practices took place on days of games. So you didn't even have that period of time of resting. We're clearly practicing more than ever before. We're playing the same amount of time, but we're practicing more and we're traveling more. The combination of all those factors obviously hurts, and we've got to find a solution. We don't have one yet. Larry, the players want expansion. You're talking about at least 44 new jobs. The owners want expansion. You're talking about a $130 million windfall for them. The media doesn't want it. They say that talent will be too diluted and that the fans are going to get shortchanged. You worried that Miami, Charlotte, Orlando, and Minnesota aren't going to be competitive? And is expansion good for the game? I look at it two ways. One is a union leader, which results in more jobs and therefore says I'm, I should be for it. I look at it as a fan. I said, I'm not particularly anxious to come into games where uh, the poor team is playing. I wouldn't necessarily downgrade the ability of those four teams that you mentioned to be competitive. Dallas became competitive in a very short period of time. And I think if they're managed properly, there are enough good players in the world to make them a competitive team. They're not going to win the championship, but they can become competitive. And there are enough fans in various sections of the country who now do not have the opportunity to see pro basketball, who would like to see pro basketball, that I think there's a good chance that it will be successful from a fan point of view also. We are talking with Larry Fleischer, who's the head of the NBA Players Association or the National Basketball Players Association. When we come back, we're going to talk about the possibility of a work stoppage. 
We're back with Mr. Larry Fleischer, Executive Director of the National Basketball Players Association. Mr. Fleischer, what is the likelihood? I mean, I realize that both sides are at least giving the image of working very hard towards avoiding one, but what is the likelihood of a work stoppage for the coming season? That's hard to answer. We've never had one in pro basketball. We've always been able to be creative enough to solve a problem before it came to that situation. Um, this is a very difficult year, probably the toughest in negotiations we've ever had. As the owners became more successful, they became more adamant in their position. Their basic position is everybody's got it wonderful, why do you want to change anything? And based upon our meetings to date, remember we started in February, so we've been meeting for eight months, we haven't gotten anywhere. Uh, I think there is a possibility that um, there may not be basketball for some period of time. I don't know when, I don't know if that's for real or not. We don't want it, that's for sure. I don't think the owners do. You know, we put a moratorium into effect uh, in June. A moratorium on signing, a moratorium on uh, filing lawsuits, a moratorium on free agents even talking with teams or rookies talking with teams. We had done that on the hope that the Cubs would have pressure brought on them by general managers and coaches to be able to get a better team. They had to see the players and they would say to their owners, let's start negotiating, let's start working this out. We also thought that we would have pressure brought on us by agents and by players wanting to get it solved. That pressure is beginning to build up, but so far it hasn't been enough. Hopefully we can get this thing resolved in uh, time before the season so we can play basketball, but at this stage I can't, I can't tell you. Larry, are things really that bad for these athletes? Starting centers are making $800,000 a year. Other players are making millions a year. And that's in salaries, benefits, and endorsements. No, I don't think the issue is whether things are so bad. I think the issue is what kind of system should they operate on? And if they're fortunate enough to be uh, a Kareem Abdul-Jabbar who is a one-of-a-kind, he shouldn't be limited in what he can earn or Larry Bird. And the system that operates today prohibits them from doing what they should be able to do. Not that they have it bad, they obviously have it far better than the overwhelming majority of the American public. But that doesn't mean they should have rights taken away from them. Are you worried that if there is a work stoppage in any size, form, or fashion, do you think it will hurt the game, the league, the situation as it exists today? Oh, it won't harm the game at all. I mean, I would not like to see it happen because economically people will be hurt, but it won't harm the game. As many people are going to go see pro football this year as seen it in the past, and there have been work stoppages. Baseball is probably having the best year attendance-wise it's ever had, and they've had work stoppages. The sport will go on. You know, everybody said if there's a strike, terrible things will happen. It won't be terrible. They'll go on. Is it conceivable that a work stoppage could be avoided at this point? And what would have to happen for both sides to get off the dime to work toward that agreement? Well, there's no question a work stoppage could be uh, halted. Uh, there's no reason for it to have to happen if um, both sides are realistic, understand the needs of the other people. I think, let me give you an example. One of the things we've discussed in great detail with the clubs is our desire to eliminate the right of first refusal. We have had it in effect uh, for six years, almost seven years. Virtually every player in the league has gone through being a free agent and the fact that he hasn't been able to sign with another club. We have told the teams and the negotiating committee that this is a disaster, that the players feel that they've been taken advantage of and used, that there is no free agency. We want to eliminate the right of first refusal. Why do they have to have it? We've gotten absolutely no response, none. As long as that position stays, then we're in real trouble. If they're not willing...